Well, I have entitled this message, and we're actually, I'm doing a countdown to revival. It's a series of sermons, and usually when I have a series of sermons, I know what direction I'm going in. And before I get into that series, I really don't know that right now. Not sure which direction we're going in, but I'm calling it the countdown to revival. Four weeks from today, we will begin our revival services. But my message for today is entitled, What in the world am I going to do with you? Husbands, has your wife ever said that to you? Wives, have you ever said that to your husband? What in the world am I going to do with you? Maybe it's a parent saying that to a child. Maybe the child was out in the front yard, got into a mud hole, wallowed around in that mud hole and tracked mud in the house. What in the world am I going to do with you? Maybe it's a teacher saying that to a student that perhaps is unruly and disruptive in the classroom. What am I going to do with you? Or what about a judge that looks upon a repeated offender that he has seen, he or she has seen many times in the courtroom, repeatedly coming before him. What in the world am I going to do with you? Well, when we look at our text today, I think we will maybe see the connection between this title and what I'm trying to get across today. We're going to be looking at Hosea. We're going to be looking at the sixth chapter of Hosea. And we're going to be reading verses 4 through 6 right now. And we'll be making reference to uh, some other passages uh, there in that same chapter. But let's look at this. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Two of the tribes there. Your love, now listen to this. I don't know that I've ever looked at this passage and, and, and thought much about it. Your love is like a morning cloud. Your love is like the dew that goes away early. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love. I don't desire sacrifice. I desire the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. May God add his blessings to the reading, the proclamation, the understanding of his holy and blessed word. What in the world am I going to do with you? Could those be the words of God right now? As he looks upon this vast domain called humanity, seeing where we are, what's going on? What in the world am I going to do with you? Obviously, God was saying that to his people and using Hosea there to ask that same question. What in the world am I going to do with you? And then we see he, he says right here, I'm paraphrasing a little of this, your love for me, your love for me is as short-lived as the dew on the morning grass. That's some pretty heavy words. God is saying, your love for me is as short-lived as the dew on the morning grass. You refuse to acknowledge your sin. You do not come to me for forgiveness. You make a pretense. In other words, you are pretending to have religion by offering all of these sacrifices, burn sacrifices or otherwise. But all I really want, he is saying is a steadfast love and knowledge of me. Wow. Okay, let's just stop for a moment. Let's just try to already soak in the little things that we've already said. Based upon what we see right here, what do you think God would have the right to do? If our love for him is short-lived, as short-lived as the dew on the morning grass, what would, what would he have the right to do? Would he have the right to scold us? 
I think so. Would he have the right to punish us? I believe so. I think he would have every right to do that because that would be uh, disobedience. It would be disobedience to him. But as we read this entire chapter here, we see that's not what God did. What did God do? When he saw these people with love as sh- love for him as short-lived as the morning dew on the grass. I see the first thing he, doing, he is doing is wanting to bring restoration. Wanting to restore that relationship. If and when we return to him. God promises right here in this text that he will restore us to health. We look at verse 1 right there. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he may heal us. He has struck us down, that he will bind us up. Now that's not good news when we look at our sin-sick society. Or maybe I should say that is the good news. But the bad news is, We are a part of a sin-sick society. Look at what we do. Look at what we do to bring about physical healing. Billions and billions and billions of dollars are spent every year on health care. The two leading causes of death in our nation right now is cancer and heart disease. The two leading causes of death. I just found out through some research this week that COVID is listed as number three right now. But we try all that we can do to bring about physical healing. We we do that through natural means. We do that through medical science. We also do that through faith. Faith in God Almighty. But as, as important as that is, there is another kind of illness that I think would be worse than that. We see it in our society, and that is a moral kind of sickness. Morality. Where are we as a nation, morally speaking? Where are we in the world, morally speaking? A major crime takes place every 2.2 seconds in America, ranging from robbery Homicide, rape, aggressive assault, Uh -uh, the list goes on. Every 2.2 seconds, homes are victimized every day in our country. And then you add to that the fact that there's so much lust, there's greed, there's envy, there's hate, there's bitterness, all of that that adds to that. And we don't have to look very far till we realize we do live in a sin-sick world. And the tragedy of our immoral, sin-sick society is that we like to rationalize our sin. Now, let's be honest. We don't like to call sin, sin, particularly if we're doing it. Now, if you're doing it, yeah, we can call that sin. You have sinned. You've done wrong. But when I do it, oh, well, I, I fell short. I didn't quite do what I needed to do. Just something about that word sin connected with me or you or us, we like to sugarcoat it. It just doesn't have the same punch if we don't call it sin. But sin is sin, and we live in a sin-sick world. We try to make sin respectable. We've tried to change the names. I heard someone say the other day, that uh, wife swapping, mm, that's probably not a good term, but we don't call it wife swapping anymore, he said. We just call that expanding the circle of love. Call it what you want to call it, but in God's eyes, and that's wrong, in God's eyes, and that's sin. But then there is another sickness in our society, and that is a spiritual illness. We see it all across our land. We see it all in our churches. And because of the moral sickness that we have, we're suffering from broken relationships. Broken relationships with God. 
broken relationships with our fellow man. And then we find all of these fears overwhelming us, all of the worries that come down upon us. And we need to realize that those are symptoms of a broken relationship with God, a broken relationship with mankind. We live in a world that is so divided, there's so much hate, there's so much hostility all around. But now the good news is that God promises to heal our brokenness. He promises to heal our brokenness if and when we return to him. Now one of the ways is that restoration. Now remember, God by nature is love. If you know anything about God, you know that God is love. Love is the greatest healing power in the entire universe. There's nothing that love cannot fix. We might, may not be able to find it. We may not be able to muster it up. But if we can, we know that love is that greatest healing power. Love restores broken relationships, whether it be in the family, in the community, in our nation. And it is through the very cross that God reconciles sinners. All because of his love for us. When we look at these human relationships all around us, and every day we're creating new human relationships, let's make sure that those human relationships don't get broken. If there's anything that Satan wants to do, he wants to break those relationships. There's that song that says, what this world needs is love, love, love. That's so true. What we need in our own lives, what we need to be radiating and reflecting is love, love, love. We need that love to bind up the wounds from those broken relationships. Those wounds that are caused by hate and bitterness and gossip and all of those things that hurt, that tear down, that mangle. Now listen, that love, that love could only be found in God. That love that we're talking about can only be found in a relationship with him. He is the source of true, genuine, authentic love. Love means a lot of things. But the greatest source of love, the greatest example of love, is Jesus Christ, God. So if and when we return to God, I'm convinced we can have that healing power. But then there's something else. There's that restoration. But I believe God wants to bring about, and I see we see this here uh, with, with uh, the people that Hosea what was speaking to here. They needed a sense of reviving in their own hearts and lives. If we return to God, I'm convinced we will understand what being revived is all about. There in verse 2, in this same chapter, after two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up that we may live for him. Now exactly what does revival mean? I remember uh, somebody telling me not too long ago, don't you know that people don't have revival anymore? They don't do revival services. That's an outdated thing. Well, I think it's something we really need in our day and time. Call it what you want to call it, but the truth is we need reviving. I'm not sure what kind of a definition you would give to revival, but, but I would say it, it would be coming back to life again. That's what revival is. To live again, to be resurrected let me give you an example. I've only had to do this a couple of times. Giving artificial respiration, CPR. When you, we, you see somebody that's unresponsive, they're down, and you're trying to pump life into them. Now, at that day and time, we did the mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation along with the chest compressions. Now the, the Red Cross, American Heart Association, are just... Uh, promoting the chest compressions. 
But when you do that, and David, you'll know a little bit about what I'm talking about, since you've done that many times, I'm sure, is bringing back life. You know, when I worked in the hospital many times, I saw that flat line on that screen. Flat line is never good. What are we trying to do when you see a flat line? You're trying to get a pulse rate. You're trying to get a heartbeat. And then when there's that, just a little flicker on that line. Oh, we got a heartbeat. We got blood pressure. And you try to move forward to restore that life. Now, we do that physically, but I think there's that same need spiritually in our lives. I believe, I believe that it is possible that church people need reviving also. I use this term a lot, going through the motions. Now, people are pretty good at that. Christian people are pretty good at that. Sunday after Sunday, they go through the motions. Now, when I look at this that Hosea is writing, who's he writing to? You ever thought about who he's writing to? He's not writing to the world here. He is writing this message to the people of God. That's who he's talking about, being revived and restored. He's talking about the people of God. That's who he's addressing. I think about another prophet. Hosea would be considered a minor prophet, but Ezekiel is considered that major prophet, one of those. And Ezekiel compares his people to a valley of dry, dead bones. And they needed to be revived. They needed to be resurrected by the word of God. Now listen. When we return to God, when we return to God, the author of life, the giver of life, we can have new life. And we can be and will be released from the bonds that drag us down. If and when we return to God. I believe that our faith will come alive. If and when. Now, well, let's be honest, okay? Be honest with yourself. I'll be honest with myself. Is your faith right now where it used to be? Look at your life. Look at your relationship with the Lord. Look at your level of faith. Is it today where it once was? And if it is not, if you reflect back on a day and time and years when, man, my faith was so strong, it was so powerful, I had such a strong walk and a relationship with, if that's not where you are right now, then guess what? You need reviving. Our faith needs reviving. Our faith needs that CPR. Now, for some, people would readily admit, I don't have any faith at all. And then there's others that would, would admit in their paucity or their scarcity of faith, I've lost my connections with God. I've lost my connections with people. I've lost my connections with how to be revived and to be rejuvenated. It is sad, but statistics tell us that in the average Protestant church, 57%, I really thought it'd be higher, 57% of the members in our Protestant churches would be considered inactive. That's right at six out of 10 in any given church would consider themselves inactive. I would say that they would have to consider themselves, if they were honest, that their level of faith is not where it once was. In mainline churches today, we've lost millions of people out of the churches just in the past decade. So, how is it with you? How is it with you? As a part of the church, playing the role or roles that you play in the church, where is your faith? And do you see yourself needing to be revived? Do you see yourself needing to be jump-started? 
Or is your faith today so strong because you find yourself in God's Word on a daily basis, you find yourself praying, not just one time a day for two or three minutes, but on a regular, consistent level, you find yourself praying to God, you read God's Word, and not only do you read it, you try to understand it, and then make application, what is God's Word saying to me right now? What difference does it make? Are you one of those that serve the Lord with gladness? Or are you just simply going through the motions? If we're not able to serve the Lord with gladness, then there's something that we need to look at in our relationship with the Lord. Does your heart need reviving? In Edinburgh, Scotland, many years ago, and there was a statue erected. It has become known as a famous statue of a little mutt dog. His name, or her name, was Bobby. B-O-B-B-I-E. No one really paid much attention to this little mutt or to the master until the master died. And once that master died, then everybody began to draw their attention to the dog. Because what did the dog do? The dog refused to leave the grave of his master. There were people in the town that wanted to come and take the dog, but he didn't want to go. And on the few occasions that they did take the dog home with them so that they could feed that dog and nurture that dog, guess what? He found his way back to the cemetery. And he found himself lying down right there with his master. Days, weeks, months passed by. But Bobby refused to leave the grave of his master until the dog himself died. Now, when I read that story, and somewhere along the way I may have shared something similar to that, maybe not quite in detail. But would our heart, our dedication to our master match up to that of that dog? Would we be that faithful? That regardless what comes, we're going to be faithful. We're going to stay with our master. See, again, I'm convinced. If we would return to God, if we would return to God, our own traditional values would be re-sparked. They would come back to life. And today, my goodness, there's so much more that can be said about values. Our values have been turned upside down. Our values are wrong side up. The things that were important and we held a high price tag to them, today's not nearly as important. Now, we can understand that in society. I don't understand it nearly as well when we, as children of God, have allowed our values to be flipped upside down. And then lastly, I think what God wants to do for us, as he promised to do right here with the people that Hosea is addressing, is there was a new vicar in their life. This is what God can do. If and when we return to God, he will, as verse 3 tells us, he will come to us as, a, as the showers, as the rain springs that water the earth. You know, there's something refreshing about a shower. I get up every morning looking forward to a shower. I want to be clean. There's a sense of refreshment there. Spring rains. Just smell the spring rains. There's such a, an aroma there a sense of refreshment. Now, we have a tendency to get tired, don't we? But what happens when we get tired, whether it be physically or whether it be spiritually? We can become very pessimistic when we get tired. We can become very cynical when we get tired. We can just be downright disgusted. But once we return to God, there's a greater sense of vigor. There's a new vigor. Life becomes exciting. Life becomes fulfilling. There is more purpose and intent in life. 
See, once we return to God, there's that exclamation part, uh, exclamation point uh, in our lives. Let me give you a few examples. What about John the Baptist? Remember John the Baptist upon seeing Christ? He said, behold, the Lamb of God, exclamation mark. That was something exciting. Behold, the Lamb of God. Then there was Andrew. We're told that Andrew ran to Peter and he shouts out, we have found the Messiah, exclamation mark. There was an exciting point, exciting time in their life. What about that woman at the well? The woman at the well that rushes back to the village and she's telling the people, come, see the man who told me all that I've ever done, exclamation mark. But well, what about Thomas, doubting Thomas, that disciple, after the resurrection, placed his hands there in the nail-scarred hands of God. And he shouted out, my God and my Lord. And then I'm reminded of that Roman soldier at the foot of the cross that cried out, truly, truly this man is the Son of God. Exclamation mark. There's a sense of excitement there. When's the last time you've had an exclamation mark in your life in serving the Lord? You do this. Exclamation mark. There's a sense of excitement. There's a sense of joy. If only we would return to God, there can be that rejuvenation. There can be that excitement. I like joy. I like excitement. I want that. I want to have that renewed relationship with the Lord, and I try to do that every day. Now, in closing, we deserve, we deserve nothing but God's judgment, don't we? We deserve nothing but God's judgment. But he offers us his grace. He offers us his mercy. But now, there's a catch. He doesn't just offer that grace and mercy. The catch is, if and when we return to God, then we can have the grace, the mercy, and that will restore that joy and excitement. Let's take heed of Hosea's invitation. Come, let us return to the Lord. Look at your life. Look at your Christian walk. Look at where your faith once was compared to where it is right now. Does it need reviving? Does it need restoration? Does it need a, a, a sense of rejuvenating? A jump start. The key to everything that I've said today lies in this point. If and when we return to God. Now, returning to God implies that you're not there. We're not at that relationship. Maybe today you find yourself here. And you know in the depths of your heart what I really need to do is to return to God. And if and when I do that, then I can count on these other things taking place. Let's pray. Thank you.